Chapter Twenty Three of Volume Three of the American Senator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Senator by Anthony Trollope. Chapter Twenty Three, Volume Three. The Senator's Lecture, Number One. Wednesday, April 14th, was the day at last fixed for the Senator's lecture. His little proposal to set England right on all those matters in which she had hitherto gone astray had created a considerable amount of attention. The Gawley affair, with the subsequent trial of Scrobby, had been much talked about, and the Senator's doings in reference to it had been made matter of comment in the newspapers. Some had praised him for courage, benevolence, and a steadfast purpose. Others had ridiculed his inability to understand manners different from those in his own country. He had seen a good deal of society both in London and in the country, and had never hesitated to express his opinions with an audacity which some had called insolence. When he had trodden with his whole weight hard down on individual corns, of course he had given offence as on the memorable occasion of the dinner at the parson's house in dillsborough but on the whole he had produced for himself a general respect among educated men which was not diminished by the fact that he seemed to count quite as little on that as on the ill-will and abuse of others for some days previous to the delivery of the lecture the hoardings of london were crowded with sesquipedalian notices of the entertainment so that Senator Gotobed's great oration on the irrationality of Englishmen was looked forward to with considerable interest. When an intelligent Japanese travels in Great Britain, or an intelligent Briton in Japan, he is struck with no wonder at national differences. He is, on the other hand, rather startled to find how like his strange brother is to him in many things. Crime is persecuted, wickedness is condoned, and goodness treated with indifference in both countries. Men care more for what they eat than anything else, and combine a closely defined idea of meum with a lax perception as to tuum. Barring a little difference of complexion and feature, the Englishman would make a good Japanese, or the Japanese a first-class Englishman. But when an American comes to us, or a Briton goes to the States, each speaking the same language, using the same cookery, governed by the same laws, and wearing the same costume, the differences which present themselves are so striking that neither can live six months in the country of the other without a holding up of the hands and a torrent of exclamations. And in nineteen cases out of twenty, the surprise and the ejaculations take the place of censure. The intelligence of the American, displayed through the nose, worries the Englishman. The unconscious self-assurance of the Englishman, not always unaccompanied by a sneer, irritates the American. They meet, as might a lad from Harrow, and another from Mr. Brumby's successful mechanical cramming establishment. The Harrow boy cannot answer a question, but is sure that he is the proper thing, and is ready to face the world on that assurance. Mr. Brumby's paragon is shocked at the other's inaptitude for examination, but is at the same time tortured by envy that he knows not of he knows not what. In this spirit, we Americans and Englishmen go on writing books about each other, sometimes with bitterness enough, but generally with good final results. But in the meantime there has sprung up a jealousy which makes each inclined to hate the other at first sight. Hate is difficult and expensive, and between America and between individuals soon gives place to love. I cannot bear Americans as a rule, though I have been very lucky myself with a few friends. Who in England has not heard that form of speech over and over again? and what Englishman has travelled in the States, without hearing abuse of all English institutions uttered amidst the pauses of a free-handed hospitality, which has left him nothing to desire. 
Mr. Senator Gotobed had expressed his mind openly wheresoever he went, but being a man of immense energy, was not content with such private utterances. He could not liberate his soul without doing something in public to convince his cousins that in their general practices of life they were not guided by reason. He had no object of making money. To give him his due, we must own that he had no object of making fame. He was impelled by that intense desire to express himself, which often amounts to passion with us, and sometimes to fury with Americans, and he hardly considered much what reception his words might receive. It was only when he was told by others that his lecture might give offence, which possibly would turn to violence, that he made inquiry as to the attendance of the police. But though they should tear him to pieces, he would say what he had to say. It should not be his fault if the absurdities of a people whom he really loved were not exposed to light, so that they might be acknowledged and abandoned. He had found time to travel to Birmingham, to Manchester, to Liverpool, to Glasgow, and to other places, and really thought that he had mastered his great subject. He had worked very hard, but was probably premature in thinking that he knew England thoroughly. He had, however, undoubtedly dipped into a great many matters, and could probably have told many Englishmen much that they didn't know about their own affairs. He had poked his nose everywhere, and had scrupled to ask no question. He had seen the miseries of a casual ward, the despair of an expiring strike, the amenities of a city slum, and the stolid apathy of a rural labourer's home. He had measured the animal food consumed by the working classes, and knew the exact amount of alcohol swallowed by the average Briton. He had seen also the luxury of baronial halls, the pearl drinking extravagant commercial palaces, the unending labours of our pleasure-seekers, as with Lord Rufford, and the dullness of ordinary country life, as experienced by himself at Bragdon. And now he was going to tell the English people at large what he thought about it all. The great room at St. James's Hall had been secured for the occasion, and Lord Drummond, the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, had been induced to take the chair. In these days our governments are very anxious to be civil to foreigners, and there is nothing that a robust Secretary of State will not do for them. On the platform there were many members of both Houses of Parliament, and almost everybody connected with the Foreign Office. Every ticket had been taken for weeks since. The front benches were filled with the wives and daughters of those on the platform, and back behind into the distant spaces in which seeing was difficult, and hearing impossible. The crowd was gathered at two shillings, sixpence a head, all of which was going to some great British charity. From half-past seven to eight Piccadilly, and Regent Street were crammed, and when the senator came himself with his chairman, he could hardly make his way in at the doors. A great treat was expected, but there were among the officers of police some who thought that a portion of the audience would not bear quietly the hard things that would be said, and that there was an uncanny gathering of roughs about the street who were not prepared to be on their best behaviour when they should be told that old England was being abused. Lord Drummond opened the proceedings by telling the audience, in a voice clearly audible to the reporters and the first half-dozen benches, that they had come there to hear what a well-informed and distinguished foreigner thought of their country. They would not, he was sure, expect to be flattered. Then flattery nothing was more useless or ignoble. This gentleman, coming from a new country in which tradition was of no avail, and on which the customs of former centuries had had no opportunities to engraft themselves, had seen many things here which, in his eyes, could not justify themselves by reason. Lord Drummond was a little too prolix for a chairman, and at last concluded by expressing his conviction that his countrymen would listen to the distinguished senator with that courtesy which was due to a foreigner and due also to the great and brotherly nation from which he had come. Then the senator rose, 
and the clapping of hands and kicking of heels was most satisfactory. There was, at any rate, no prejudice at the onset. "'English ladies and gentlemen,' he said, "'I am in the unenviable position of having to say hard things to you for about an hour and a half together, if I do not drive you from your seats before my lecture is done. And this is the more the pity, because I could talk to you for three hours about your country and not say an unpleasant word. His lordship has told you that flattery is not my purpose. Neither is praise, which would not be flattery. Why should I collect three or four thousand people here to tell them of virtues, the consciousness of which is the inheritance of each of them? You are brave and generous, and you are lovely to look at, with sweet polished manners. But you know all that quite well enough without my telling you. But it strikes me that you do not know how little prone you are to admit the light of reason into either your public or private life, and how generally you allow yourselves to be guided by traditions, prejudices, and customs which should be obsolete. If you will consent to listen to what one foreigner thinks, though he himself be a man of no account, you may perchance gather from his words something of the opinion of bystanders in general, and so be able, perhaps a little, to rectify your gait and your costume and the tones of your voice, as we are all apt to do when we come from our private homes out among the eye of the public. This was received very well. The senator spoke with a clear, sonorous voice, no doubt with a twang, but so audibly as to satisfy the room in general. I shall not, he said, dwell much on your form of government. Were I to praise a republic, I might seem to belittle your throne and the lady who sits on it, an offence which would not be endured for a moment by English ears. I will take the monarchy as it is, simply remarking that its recondite forms are very hard to be understood by foreigners, and that they seem to me to be for the most part equally dark to natives. I have hardly as yet met two Englishmen who were agreed as to the political power of the sovereign, and most of those of whom I have inquired have assured me that the matter is one as to which they have not found it worth their while to make inquiry. Here a voice from the end of the hall made some protestation, but the nature of the protest did not reach the platform. But, continued the senator, now rising into energy, Though I will not meddle with your form of government, I may, I hope, be allowed to allude to the political agents by which it is conducted. You are proud of what you have your parliament. We are, said a voice. I wonder of which house. I do not ask the question that it may be answered, because it is advisable at the present moment that there should be only one speaker. That labour is, unfortunately for me, at present in my hands, and I am sure you will agree with me that it should not be divided. You mean, probably, that you are proud of your House of Commons, and that you are so because it speaks with the voice of the people, the voice of the people, in order that it may be heard without unjust preponderance on this side or on that requires much manipulation. That manipulation has, in latter years, been affected by your reform bills, of which during the last half-century there have in fact been four or five, the latter in favour of the ballot having been perhaps the greatest. There have been bills for purity of elections, very necessary, bills for creating constituencies, bills for abolishing them, bills for dividing them, bills for extending the suffrage, and bills, if I am not mistaken, for curtailing it. And what has been the result? How many men are there in this room who know the respective nature of their votes? And is there a single woman who knows the political worth of her husband's vote? Passing the other day from the bank of this great metropolis to its suburb called Brentford, journeying as I did the whole way through continuous rows of houses, I found myself at first in a very ancient borough returning four members, double the usual number not because of its population, but because it had always been so. Here I was informed that the residents had little or nothing to do with it. I was told, though I did not quite believe what I heard, that there were no residents. The voters, however, at any rate, the influential voters, 
never pass a night there and combine their city franchise with franchises elsewhere i then went through two enormous boroughs one so old as to have a great political history of its own and the other so new as to have none it did strike me as odd that there should be a new borough with new voters and new franchises not yet ten years old in the midst of this city of london but when i came to brentford everything was changed i was not in a town at all though i was surrounded on all sides by houses everything around me was grim and dirty enough but i am supposed to have reached politically the rustic beauties of the country those around me who had votes voted for the county of middlesex on the other side of the invisible border i had just passed the poor wretch the three shillings a day who lived in a grimy lodging or a half-built hut but who at any rate possessed the political privilege now i had suddenly emerged among the aristocrats and quite another state of things prevailed is that a reasonable manipulation of the votes of the people does that arrangement give to any man an equal share in his country and yet i fancy the thing is so little thought of that few among you are aware that in this way the largest classes of british labour is excluded from the franchise in a country which boasts of equal representation the chief object of your first reform bill was that of realising the very fact of representation up to that time your members of the house of commons were in truth deputies of the lords or of other rich men lord a or mr b or perhaps lady c sent whom she pleased to parliament to represent this or that town or occasionally this or that county that that absurdity is supposed to be passed and on evils that have been cured no one should dwell but how is it now i have a list in my memory for i would not care to make out so black a catalogue in legible letters of forty members who have been returned to the present house of commons by the single voices of influential persons what will not forty voices do even in your parliament and if i can count forty how many more must there be of which i have not heard then there was a voice calling upon the senator to name those men and other voices denying the fact i will name no one said the senator how could i tell what noble friend i might put on the stool of repentance by doing so and he looked round on the gentlemen on the platform behind him but i defy any member of parliament here present to get up and say that it is not so then he paused a moment and if it be so is that rational is that in accordance with the theory of representation as to which you have all been so ardent and which you profess to be so dear to you is the co- is the country not overridden by the aristocracy when lord lambswool not only possesses his own hereditary seat in the house of lords but also has a seat for his eldest son in the house of commons then a voice from the back called out what the deuce is all that to you end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of volume three of the american center by anthony trollope this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter twenty four of volume three the senator's lecture number two if i see a man hungry in the street said the senator instigated by the question asked him at the end of the last chapter and give him a bit of bread i don't do it for my own sake but for his up to this time the britishers around him on the platform and those in the benches near to him had received what he had said with a good grace the allusion to lord lambswool had not been pleasant to them but it had not been worse than they had expected but now they were displeased 
they did not like being told that they were taking a bit of bread from him in their own political destitution they did not like that he an individual should presume that he had bread to offer to them as a nation and yet had they argued it out in their own minds they would have seen that the senator's metaphor was appropriate his purpose of being there was to give advice and theirs in coming to listen to it but it was unfortunate when i ventured to come before you here i made all this my business continued the senator then he paused and glanced round the hall with a defiant look and now about your house of lords he went on i have not much to say about the house of lords because if i understand rightly the feeling of this country it is already condemned no such thing who told you that you know nothing about it these and other words of curt denial came from the distant corners and a slight murmur of disapprobation was heard even from the seats on the platform then lord drummond got up and begged that there might be silence mr gotobed had come there to tell them his views and as they had come there expressly to listen to him they could not without impropriety interrupt him that such will be the feeling of the country before long continued the senator i think no one can doubt who has learned how to look to the signs of the times in such matters is it possible that the theory of a hereditary legislature can be defended with reason for a legislature you want the best and wisest of your people you don't get them in america said a voice which was beginning to be recognized we try at any rate said the senator now is it possible that an accident of birth should give you excellence and wisdom what is the result not a tenth of your hereditary legislatures assemble in the beautiful hall that you have built for them and of that tenth the greater half consists of councillors of state who have been placed there in order that the business of the country may not be brought to a standstill your hereditary chamber is a fiction supplemented by the element of election the election resting generally in the very bosom of the house of commons on this subject although he had promised to be short he said much more which was received for the most part in silence but when he ended by telling them that they could have no right to call themselves a free people till every legislator in the country was elected by the votes of the people another murmur was heard through the hall i told you said he waxing more and more energetic as he felt the opposition which he was bound to overcome that what i had to say to you would not be pleasant if you cannot endure to hear me let us break up and go away in that case i must tell my friends at home that the tender ears of a british audience cannot bear rough words from american lips and yet if you think and yet if you think of it we have borne rough words from you and have borne them with good humour again he paused but as none rose from their seats he went on proceeding from hereditary legislature i come to hereditary property it is natural that a man should wish to give his children after his death the property which he has enjoyed during their life but let me ask any man here who has not been born an eldest son himself whether it is natural that he should wish to give it all to one son would any man think of doing so by the light of his own reason out of his own head as we say would any man be so unjust to those who are equal in his love were he not constrained by law and by custom more iron-handed even than the law the senator had here made a mistake very common with americans and a great many voices were on him at once what law there is no law you know nothing about it go back and learn what cried the senator coming forward to the extreme verge of the platform and putting down his foot as though there was strength enough in his leg to crush them all will any one have the hardihood to tell me that property in this country is not affected by primogeniture go back and learn the law i know the law perhaps better than most of you do you mean to assert that my lord Lanswool can leave his land to whom he pleases i tell you that he has no more than a life interest in it and that his son will only have the same 
Then an eager Briton on the platform got up and whispered to the censor for a few minutes, during which the murmuring was continued. "'My friend reminds me,' said the senator, "'that the matter is one of custom rather than law, and I am obliged to him. But the custom, which is damnable and cruel, is backed by law, which is equally so. If I have land, I can not only give it all to my eldest son, but I can assure the right of primogeniture to his son, though he be not yet born. No one, I think, will deny that there must be special law to enable me to commit an injustice so unnatural as that. Hence it comes that you still suffer under an aristocracy almost as dominant, and in its essence as irrational, as that which created feudalism. The gentlemen collected on the platform looked at each other and smiled, perhaps failing to catch the exact meaning of the senator's words. A lord here has a power as a lord, which he cannot himself fathom, and of which he daily makes an unconscious but most deleterious use. He is brought up to think it natural that he should be a tyrant. The proclivities of his order are generous, and as a rule he gives more than he takes. But he is as injurious to the one process as in the other. Your ordinary Briton in his dealing with a lord expects payment in some shape for every repetition of the absurd title, and payment is made. The titled aristocrat pays dearer for his horse, dearer for his coat, dearer for his servant than other people. But, in return, he exacts much which no other person can get. Knowing his own magnanimity, he expects that his word shall not be questioned. If I may be allowed, I will tell you a little story as to one of the most generous gentlemen I have had the happiness of meeting in this country, which will explain my meaning. Then, without mentioning names, he told the story of Lord Rufford, Gawley, and Scrobby, in such a way as partly to redeem himself with his audience. He acknowledged how absolutely he had been himself befooled, and how he had been done out of his money by misplaced sympathy. He made Mrs. Gawley's goose immortal, and in imitating the indignation of Runts the farmer and Bean the gamekeeper, showed that he was master of considerable humour but he brought it all round at last to his own purpose, and ended this episode of his lecture by his view of the absurdity and illegality of British hunting. "'I can talk about it to you,' he said, "'and you will know whether I am speaking the truth. And when I get home among my own people and repeat my lecture here, as I shall do, with some little additions as to the good things I have found here from which your ears may be spared,' I shall admit this story, as I know it will be impossible to make my countrymen believe that a hundred harem-scarum tomboys may ride at their pleasure over every man's land, destroying crops and trampling down fences, going, if their vermin leads them there, with reckless violence into the sweet domestic gardens of your country residences, and that no one can either stop them or punish them. An American will believe much about the wonderful ways of his British cousin— but no American will be got to believe that till he sees it. I find, said he, that this irrationality, as I have ventured to call it, runs through all your professions. We will take the church as being the highest, at any rate, in its objects. Then he recapitulated all those arguments against our mode of dispensing church patronage, with which the reader is already familiar if he has attended to the senator's earlier words as given in this chronicle. In other lines of business there is, even here in England, some attempt made to get the man best suited for the work he has to do. If anyone wants a domestic servant, he sets about the work of getting a proper person in a very determined manner indeed. But for the care, or as you call it, the cure, of his soul, he has to put up with the man who has bought the right to minister to his wants, or with him whose father wants a means of living for his younger son, the elder being destined to swallow all the family property, or with him who has become sick of drinking his wine in Oxford College, or with him again who has pleaded his cause successfully with a bishop's daughter. It is not often that the British public is angered by abuse of the church, and this part of the lecture was allowed to pass without strong marks of disapprobation. "'I have been at some trouble,' he continued, 
to learn the very complex rules by which your army is now regulated, and those by which it was regulated a very short time since. Unhappily for me, I have found it in a state of transition, and nothing is so difficult to a stranger's comprehension as a transition state of affairs. But this I can see plainly that every improvement which is made is received by those whom it most concerns with a horror which amounts almost to madness. So lovely to the ancient British well-born feudal instinct is a state of unreason that the very absence of any principle endears, it to, endears to it institutions which no one can attempt to support by argument. Had such a thing not existed as the right to purchase military promotion, would any satirist have been listened to who had suggested it was a possible outcome of British irrationality? Think what it carries with it. The man who has proved himself fit to serve his country by serving it in twenty fought and fields, who has bled for his country and perhaps preserved his country, shall rot in obscurity because he has no money to buy promotion, whereas the young dandy who has done no more than glitter among, along the pavements with his sword and spurs shall have the command of men because he has so many thousand dollars in his pocket. Boncombe, shouted the inimical voice. "'But is it Buncombe? asked the intrepid senator. "'Will anyone who knows what he is talking about say that I am describing a state of things which did not exist yesterday? I will acknowledge that this has been rectified, though I see symptoms of relapse. A fault that has been mended is a fault no longer. But what I speak of now is the disruption of all concord in your army caused by the reform which has forced itself upon you. All loyalty has gone, all that love of his profession, which should be the breath of a soldier's nostrils. A fine body of fighting heroes is heartbroken, not because a fine body of fighting heroes is broken-hearted, not because injury has been done to them or to any of them, but because the system has become peculiarly British by reason of its special absurdity and therefore peculiarly dear. Buncombe, again said the voice, and the word was now repeated by a dozen voices. Let any one show me that it is Buncombe. If I say what is untrue, do with me what you please. If I am ignorant, set me right and laugh at me. But if what I say is true, then your interruption is surely a sign of imbecility. I say that the change was forced upon you by the feeling of the people, and that its very expediency has demoralized the army, because the army was irrational. And how is it with the navy? What am I to believe when I hear so many conflicting statements among yourselves? During this last appeal, however, the noise at the back of the hall had become so violent that the senator was hardly able to make his voice heard by those immediately around him. He himself did not quail for a moment, going on with his gestures and setting down his foot as though he was still confident in his purpose of overcoming all opposition. He had not much above half done yet. There were the lawyers before him, and the civil service, and the railways, and the commerce of the country, and the labouring classes. But Lord Drummond and the others near him were becoming terrified, thinking that something worse might occur unless an end were put to the proceedings. Then a superintendent of police came in and whispered to his lordship. A crowd was collecting itself in Piccadilly and St. James's Street, and perhaps the senator had better be withdrawn. The officer did not think he could safely answer for the consequences if they were carried on for a quarter of an hour if this were carried on for a quarter of an hour longer. The Lord Drummond, having meditated for a moment, touched the senator's arm and suggested a withdrawal into a side room for a minute. Mr. Go to bed, he said. A little feeling has been excited, and we had better put an end to this for the present. Put an end to it? I am afraid we must. The police are becoming alarmed. Oh, of course. You know best. In our country a man is allowed to express himself unless he other utters either blasphemy or calumny. 
"'But I am in your hands, and of course you must do as you please.' Then he sat down in a corner and wiped his brow. Lord Drummond returned to the hall, and there endeavoured to explain that the lecture was over for that night. The row was so great that it did not matter much what he said, but the people soon understood that the American senator was not to appear before them again. It was not much after nine o'clock when the senator reached his hotel, Lord Drummond having accompanied him thither in a cab. "'Good night, Mr. Gotobed,' said his lordship. "'I cannot tell you how much I respect both your purpose and your courage, "'but I don't know how far it is wise for a man to tell any other man, "'much less a nation, of all his faults. "'You English tell us of ours pretty often,' said the senator. "'When he found himself alone, he thought of it all. "'giving himself no special credit for what he had done, "'acknowledging to himself that he had often chosen his words badly "'and expressed himself imperfectly, "'but declaring to himself through it all "'that the want of reason among Britishers was so great "'that no one ought to treat... Chapter Twenty Five of Volume Three of the American Senator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford. The American Senator by Antony Trollope. Chapter Twenty Five of Volume Three: The Last Days of Mary Masters. The triumph of Mary Masters was something more than a nine days' wonder to the people of Dillsborough. They had all known Larry Twentyman's intentions and aspirations, and had generally condemned the young lady's obduracy, thinking, and not being slow to say, that she would live to repent her perversity. Runciman, who had a thoroughly warm-hearted friendship for both the attorney and Larry, had sometimes been very severe on Mary. She wants a touch of hardship, he would say, to bring her to. If Larry would just give her a cold shoulder for six months, she'd be ready to jump into his arms. And Dr. Nupper had been heard to remark that she might go farther and fare worse. If it were my girl, I'd let her know all about it, Ribs the butcher had said in the bosom of his own family. When it was found that Mr. Surtees, the curate, was not to be the fortunate man, the matter was more inexplicable than ever. Had it then been declared that the owner of Hoppet Hall had proposed to her, all these tongues would have been silenced, and the refusal even of Larry Twentyman would have been justified. But what was to be said, and what was to be thought, when it was known that she was to be the mistress of Bragton? For a day or two the prosperity of the attorney was hardly to be endured by his neighbours. When it was first known that the stewardship of the property was to go back into his hands, his rise in the world was for a time slightly prejudicial to his popularity, but this greatest stroke of luck, this latter promotion which would place him so much higher in Dillsborough than even his father or his grandfather had ever been, was a great trial of friendship. Mrs. Masters felt it all very keenly. All possibility for reproach against either her husband or her stepdaughter was, of course, at an end. Even she did not pretend to say that Mary ought to refuse the squire. Nor, as far as Mary was concerned, could she have further recourse to the evils of ushanting and the peril of social intercourse with ladies and gentlemen. It was manifest that Mary was to be a lady with a big house and many servants, and, no doubt, a carriage and horses. But still Mrs. Masters was not quite silenced. She had daughters of her own, and would solace herself by declaring to them, to her husband, and to her specially intimate friends, that of course they would see no more of Mary. It wasn't for them to expect to be asked to Bragton and as for herself, she would much rather not. She knew her own place and what she was born to, 
and wasn't going to let her own children spoil themselves and ruin their chances by dining at seven o'clock and being waited upon by servants at every turn. Thank God her girls could make their own beds, and she hoped they might continue to do so at any rate till they had houses of their own. And there seemed to Dillsborough to be some justification for all this, in the fact that Mary was now living at Bragton, and that she did not apparently intend to return to her father's house. At this time Reginald Morton himself was still at Hoppet Hall, and had declared that he would remain there till after his marriage. Lady Ushant was living at the big house, which was henceforth to be her home. Mary was her visitor, and was to be married from Bragton, as though Bragton were her residence rather than the squire's. The plan had originated with Reginald, and when it had been hinted to him that Mary would in this way seem to slight her father's home, he had proposed that all the masters should come and stay at Bragton previous to the ceremony. Mrs. Masters yielded as to Mary's residence, saying with mock humility that of course she had no room fit to give a marriage feast to the squire of Bragton, but she was steadfast in saying to her husband, who made the proposition to her, that she would stay at home. Of course she would be present at the wedding, but she would not trouble the like of Lady Ushant by any prolonged visiting. The wedding was to take place about the beginning of May, and all these things were being considered early in April. At this time one of the girls was always at Bragton, and Mary had done her best, but hitherto in vain, to induce her stepmother to come to her. When she heard that there was a doubt as to the accomplishment of the plan for the coming of the whole family, she drove herself to Dillsborough in the old Phaeton, and then pleaded her cause for herself. Mamma, she said, won't you come with the girls and papa on the twenty-ninth? I think not, my dear. The girls can go if they like it, but it will be more fitting for papa and me to come to the church on the morning. Why more fitting, mamma? Well, my dear, it will. Dear mamma, why, why? Of course, my dear, I am very glad that you are going to get such a lift. My lift is marrying the man I love. That, of course, is all right. I have nothing on earth to say against it, and I will say that through it all you have behaved as a young woman should. I don't think you meant to throw yourself at him. Mamma! But as it is turned up, you have to go one way and me another. No! But it must be so. The squire of Bragton is the squire, and his wife must act accordingly. Of course you'll be visiting at Rufford and Hampton Wick and all the places. I know very well who I am and what I came from. I'm not a bit ashamed of myself, but I'm not going to stick myself up with my betters. Then, Mamma, I shall come and be married from here. It's too late for that now, my dear. No, it is not. And then a couple of tears began to roll down from her eyes. I won't be married without your coming in to see me the night before, and being with me in the morning when I dress. Haven't I been a good child to you, Mamma? Then the stepmother began to cry also. Haven't I, Mamma? Yes, my dear, whimpered the poor woman. And won't you be my Mamma to the last, won't you? and she threw her arms around her stepmother's neck and kissed her. I won't go one way and you another. He doesn't wish it. It is quite different from that. I don't care a straw for Hampton, Wick, and Rufford, but I will never be separated from you and the girls and papa. Say you will come, mamma. I will not let you go till you say you will come. Of course she had her own way, and Mrs. Masters had to feel with a sore heart that she also must go out ushanting. She knew that, in spite of her domestic powers, she would be stricken dumb in the drawing-room at Bragton, and was unhappy. Mary had another scheme in which she was less fortunate. She took it into her head that Larry Twentyman might possibly be induced to come to her wedding. She had heard how he had ridden and gained honour for himself on the day that the hounds killed their fox at Norrington, 
and thought that perhaps her own message to him had induced him so far to return to his old habits. And now she longed to ask him, for her sake, to be happy once again. If any girl ever loved the man she was going to marry with all her heart, this girl loved Reginald Morton. He had been to her, when her love was hopeless, so completely the master of her heart, that she could not realize the possibility of affection for another. But yet she was pervaded by a tenderness of feeling in regard to Larry, which was love also, though love altogether of another kind. She thought of him daily. His future well-being was one of the cares of her life. That her husband might be able to call him a friend was among her prayers. Had anybody spoken ill of him in her presence, she would have resented it hotly. Had she been told that another girl had consented to be his wife, she would have thought that girl to be happy in her destiny. When she heard that he was leading a wretched, moping, aimless life for her sake, her heart was sad within her. It was necessary to the completion of her happiness that Larry should recover his tone of mind and be her friend. Reg, she said, leaning on his arm out in the park, I want you to do me a favor. Watch and chain? Don't be an idiot. You know I've got a watch and chain. Some girls like, too. To have the wooden bridge pulled down and a stone one built. If anyone touched a morsel of that sacred timber, he should be banished from Bragton forever. I want you to ask Mr. Twentyman to come to our wedding. Who's to do it? Who's to bell the cat? You. I would sooner fight a Saracen or ride such a horse as kill that poor Major. Joking apart, I don't see how it is to be done. Why do you wish it? Because I am so fond of him. Oh, indeed. If you're a goose, I'll hit you. I am fond of him. Next to you and my own people and Lady Ushant, I like him best in all the world. What a pity you couldn't have put him up a little higher. I used to think so, too, only I couldn't. If anybody loved you as he did me, offered you everything he had in the world, thought that you were the best in the world, would have given his life for you, would you not be grateful? I don't know that I need wish to ask such a person to my wedding. Yes, you would, if in that way you could build a bridge to bring him back to happiness. And Reg, though you used to despise him, I never despised him. A little, I think, before you knew him, but he is not despicable. Not at all, my dear. He is honest and good, and has a real heart of his own. I am afraid he has parted with that. You know what I mean, and if you won't be serious, I shall think there is no seriousness in you. I want you to tell me how it can be done. Then he was serious, and tried to explain to her that he could not very well do what she wanted. He is your friend, you know, rather than mine, but if you like to write to him you can do so. This seemed to her to be very difficult, and, as she thought more of it, almost impossible. A written letter remains, and may be taken as evidence of so much more than it means, but a word sometimes may be spoken, which, if it be well spoken, if assurance of its truth be given by the tone and by the eye of the speaker, shall do so much more than any letter, and shall yet only remain with the hearer as the remembrance of the scent of a flower remains. Nevertheless, she did at last write the letter, and brought it to her husband. Is it necessary that I should see it? he asked. Not absolutely necessary. Then send it without. But I should like you to see what I have said. You know about things, and if it is too much or too little you can tell me. Then he read her letter, which ran as follows. Dear Mr. Twentyman, perhaps you have heard that we are to be married on Thursday, May 6th. I do so wish that you would come. It would make me so much happier on that day. We shall be very quiet, and if you would come to the house at eleven, you could go across the park with them all to the church. I am to be taken in a carriage because of my finery. Then there will be a little breakfast. Papa and Mamma and Dolly and Kate would be so glad, 
and so would Mr. Morton. But none of them will be half so glad as your old, old affectionate friend, Mary Masters. If that don't fetch him, said Reginald, he is a poorer creature than I take him to be. But I may send it? Certainly you may send it. And so the letter was sent across to Choughton Farm. But the letter did not fetch him, nor am I prepared to agree with Mr. Morton that he was a poor creature for not being fetched. There are things which the heart of a man should bear without whimpering, but which it cannot bear in public with that appearance of stoical indifference which the manliness of a man is supposed to require. Were he to go, should he be jovial before the wedding party, or should he be sober and saturnine? Should he appear to have forgotten his love, or should he go about lovelorn among the wedding guests? It was impossible, at any rate impossible as yet, that he should fall into that state of almost brotherly regard which it was so natural that she should desire. But as he had determined to forgive her, he went across that afternoon to the house, and was the bearer of his own answer. He asked Mrs. Hopkins, who came to the door, whether she were alone, and was then shown into an empty room where he waited for her. She came to him as quickly as she could, leaving Lady Ushant in the middle of the page she was reading, and feeling as she tripped downstairs that the colour was rushing to her face. "'You will come, Larry,' she said. "'No, Miss Masters.' "'Let me be Mary till I am Mrs. Morton,' she said, trying to smile. "'I was always Mary.' And then she burst into tears. "'Why, why won't you come?' "'I should only stalk about like a ghost. I couldn't be Mary as a man should be at a wedding. I don't see how a man is to do such a thing.' She looked up into his face, imploring him. Not to come, for that she felt now to be impossible, but imploring him to express in some way forgiveness of the sin she had committed against him. But I shall think of you, and shall wish you well. And after that we shall be friends? By and by, if he pleases. He will please, he does please. Of course he saw what I wrote to you. And now, Larry, if I have ever treated you badly, say that you pardon me. If I had known it, he said, how could I tell you till he had spoken? And yet I knew it myself. It has been so, oh, ever so long. What could I do? You will say that you will forgive me? Yes, I will say that. And you will not go away from Choton? Oh, no, they tell me I ought to stay here, and I suppose I shall stay. I thought I'd just come over and say a word. I'm going away to-morrow for a month. There is a fellow who has got some fishing in Ireland. Good-bye. Good-bye, Larry. And I thought perhaps you'd take this now. Then he brought out from his pocket a little ruby ring which he had carried often in his pocket to the attorney's house, thinking that perhaps then might come the happy hour in which he could get her to accept it. But the hour had never come as yet, and the ring had remained in the little drawer beneath his looking-glass. Chapter 26 of Volume 3 of The American Senator This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford. The American Senator by Antony Trollope. Chapter 26 of Volume 3. Conclusion. The Senator from Akiwa, whose name we have taken for a book, which might perhaps have been better called The Chronicle of a Winter at Dillsborough, did not stay long in London after the unfortunate close of his lecture. He was a man not very pervious to criticism, nor afraid of it, but he did not like the treatment he had received at St. James Hall, nor the remarks which his lecture produced in the newspapers. He was angry because people were unreasonable with him, which was surely unreasonable in him who accused Englishmen generally of want of reason. 
One ought to take it as a matter of course that a bull should use his horns and a wolf his teeth. The senator read everything that was said of him, and then wrote numerous letters to the different journals which had condemned him. Had any one accused him of an untruth, or had his inaccuracies been glaring? Had he not always expressed his readiness to acknowledge his own mistake, if convicted of ignorance? But when he was told that he had persistently trodden upon all the corns of his English cousins, he declared that corns were evil things which should be abolished, and that with corns such as these there was no mode of abolition so efficacious as treading on them. "'I am sorry that you should have encountered anything so unpleasant,' Lord Drummond said to him when he went to bid adieu to his friend at the Foreign Office. And I am sorry, too, my lord, for your sake rather than my own. A man is in a bad case who cannot endure to hear of his faults. Perhaps you take our national sins a little too much for granted. I don't think so, my lord. If you knew me to be wrong, you would not be so sore with me. Nevertheless, I am under deep obligation for kind-hearted hospitality. If an American can make up his mind to crack up everything he sees here, there is no part of the world in which he can get along better. He had already written a long letter home to his friend, Mr. Josiah Scroom, and had impartially sent to that gentleman not only his own lecture, but also a large collection of the criticisms made on it. A few weeks afterwards he took his departure, and when we last heard of him was thundering in the Senate against certain practices on the part of his own country which he thought to be unjust to other nations. Don Quixot was not more just than the senator, or more philanthropic, nor perhaps more apt to wage war against the windmills. Having in this our last chapter given the place of honour to the senator, we must now say a parting word as to those countrymen of our own who have figured in our pages. Lord Rufford married Miss Peng, of course, and used the lady's fortune in buying the property of Sir John Purifoy. We may probably be safe in saying that the acquisition added very little to his happiness. What difference can it make to a man whether he has forty or fifty thousand pounds a year, or at any rate to such a man? Perhaps Miss Peng herself was an acquisition. He did not hunt so often or shoot so much, and was seen in church once at least on every Sunday. In a very short time his friends perceived that a very great change had come over him. He was growing fat, and soon disliked the trouble of getting up early to go to a distant meet. And before a year or two had passed away, it had become an understanding thing that in country houses he was not one of the men who went down at night into the smoking-room in a short dressing-coat and a picturesque cap. Miss Peng had done all this. He had had his period of pleasure, and no doubt the change was desirable, but he sometimes thought with regret of the promise Arabella Trefoil had made him that she would never interfere with his gratification. At Dillsborough everything during the summer after the squire's marriage fell back into its usual routine. The greatest change made there was in the residence of the attorney, who with his family went over to live at Hoppet Hall, giving up his old house to a young man from Norrington, who had become his partner, but keeping the old office for his business. Mrs. Masters did, I think, like the honour and glory of the big house, but she would never admit that she did. And when she was constrained, once or twice in the year, to give a dinner to her stepdaughter's husband and Lady Ushant, that, I think, was really a period of discomfort to her. When at Bragton she could at any rate be quiet, and Mary's caressing care almost made the place pleasant to her. Mr. Runciman prospers at the bush, though he has entirely lost his best customer, Lord Rufford. But the U. R. U. is still strong in spite of the philosophers, and in the hunting season the boxes of the bush inn are full of horses. The club goes on without much change, Mr. Masters being very regular in his attendance, undeterred by the grandeur of his new household. And Larry is always there, with increased spirit, for he has dined two or three times lately at Hampton Wick, 
having met young Hampton at the squire's house at Bragton. On this point Fred Botsey was for a time very jealous, but he found that Larry's popularity was not to be shaken, and now is very keen in pushing an intimacy with the owner of Choughton Farm. Perhaps the most stirring event in the neighbourhood has been the retirement of Captain Glomax from the post of master. When the season was over, he made an application to Lord Rufford respecting certain stable and kennel expenses, which that nobleman snubbed very bluntly. Thereupon the captain intimated to the committee that unless some advances were made, he should go. The committee refused, and thereupon the captain went not altogether to the dissatisfaction of the farmers, with whom an itinerant master is seldom altogether popular. Then, for a time, there was great gloom in the URU. What hunting man or woman does not know the gloom which comes over a hunting county, when one master goes before another is ready to step into his shoes? There had been a hope, a still growing hope, that Lord Rufford would come forward at any such pinch, but since Miss Peng had come to the front, that hope had altogether vanished. There was a word said at Rufford on the subject, but Miss Peng, or Lady Rufford as she was then, at once put her foot on the project and extinguished it. Then, when despair was imminent, old Mr. Hampton gave way, and young Mr. Hampton came forward, acknowledged on all sides as the man for the place. A master always does appear at last though for a time it appears that the kingdom must come to an end, because no one will consent to sit on the throne. Perhaps the most loudly triumphant man in Dillsborough was Mr. Mainwaring, the parson, when he heard of the discomfiture of Senator Gotobed. He could hardly restrain his joy, and confided first to Dr. Nupper, and then to Mr. Runciman, his opinion that of all the blackguards that had ever put their foot in Dillsborough, that vile Yankee was the worst. Mr. Gotobed was no more a Yankee than was the parson himself, but of any distinction among the citizens of the United States, Mr. Mainwaring knew very little. A word or two more must be said of our dear friend Larry Twentyman, for in finishing this little story we must own that he has in truth been our hero. He went away on his fishing expedition, and when he came back the girl of his heart had become Mrs. Morton. Hunting had long been over then, but the great hunting difficulty was in course of solution, and Larry took his part in the matter. When there was a suggestion as to a committee of three, than which nothing for hunting purposes could be much worse, there was a question whether he should not be one of them. This nearly killed both the Botseys. The evil thing was prevented by the timely pressure put on old Mr. Hampton, but the excitement did our friend Larry much good. Bicycle and the other mare were at once summered with the greatest care, and it is generally understood that young Hampton means to depend upon Larry very much in regard to the Rufford side of the country. Larry has bought Guarley's two fields, Guarley having altogether vanished from those parts, and is supposed to have Dillsborough Wood altogether in his charge. He is frequently to be seen at Hoppet Hall, calling there every Saturday to take down the attorney to the Dillsborough Club, as was his habit of old. But it would perhaps be premature to say that there are very valid grounds for the hopes which Mrs. Masters already entertains in reference to Kate. Kate is still too young and childish to justify any prediction in that quarter. What further need be said as to Reginald and his happy bride? Very little, except that in the course of her bridal tour she did gradually find words to give him a true and accurate account of all her own feelings from the time at which he first asked her to walk with him across the bridge, over the dill, and look at the old place. They had both passed their childish years there but could have but little thought that they were destined then to love and grow old together. I was longing, longing, longing to come, she said. And why didn't you come? How little you know about girls! Of course I had to go with the one I, 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 well, with the one I did not love down to the very soles of his feet. And then there was the journey with the parrot. 
I rather liked the bird. I don't know that you said very much, but I think you would have said less if there had been no bird. In fact, I have been a fool all along. You weren't a fool when you took me out through the orchard and caught me when I jumped over the wall. Do you remember when you asked me all of a sudden whether I should like to be your wife? You weren't a fool then. But you knew what was coming. Not a bit of it. I knew it wasn't coming. I had quite made up my mind about that. I was as sure of it, oh, as sure of it as I am, that I've got you now. And then it came, like a great thunderclap. A thunderclap, Mary? Well, yes, I wasn't quite sure at first. You might have been laughing at me, mightn't you? Just the kind of joke for me. How was I to understand it all in a moment? And you made me repeat all those words. I believed it then, or I shouldn't have said them. I knew that must be serious. And so she deified him, and sat at his feet looking up into his eyes, and fooled him for a while into the most perfect happiness that a man ever knows in this world. But she was not altogether happy herself till she had got Larry to come to her at the house at Bragton, and swear to her that he would be her friend.' 